Hello there, and thank you for tuning in to see what the world looks like through atheist eyes. I'm Frank Zindler from American Atheist Press, and I shall be your host for this fourth and final interview uh, with the Ohio State University historian, Professor David Brackey, an internationally acknowledged authority on Gnosticism and other aspects of early Christian history. Today's program will deal with the course he created for the Teaching Companies series, The Great Courses. It's a great honor to be chosen to be a master teacher for the Teaching Company, and Dr. Brackey's contribution to The Great Courses is titled Gnosticism, From Nag Hammadi to the Gospel of Judas. Let's go right to the interview. Hello there, and welcome once again to through Atheist Eyes with Frank Zindler. This will be the fourth interview that I've had the pleasure of conducting with Dr. David Brackey from The Ohio State University, an authority on Gnosticism and a bunch of other things that we've talked about so far. In this last interview that we are going to have, I want to devote some time to talking about Dr. Brackey's uh, Great Courses course from The Teaching Company called Gnosticism, From Nag Hammadi to the Gospel of Judas. It comes out in DVD form or CD form. I guess there's a, an audio version of it, too, yeah. that you can listen to in the car. Yeah. Um, I uh, have the DVD version of it, but it also comes with a, a book of outlines of the lectures. And I mentioned there's also a transcript, too, isn't there, that people can buy? Well, the, the book, I mean, those are pretty detailed notes. Yeah, so they, they are. Yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty, they're pretty good. Yeah, so. but often you can also, for a large amount of money, you can get the Yeah, actual, that I don't know about. Yeah, you but, can actually get the full transcript. those are pretty good notes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I yeah, agree. yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah, so if you don't remember everything that he says, you've got it pretty much in here. Um, this is uh, of interest to me and maybe to my readers, too. Uh, I have been following the great courses for quite a few years now. In fact, as I was telling Dr. Brackey as we came here, uh, I counted up the number of great courses I have in my library, and I have 193 of them. Wow. Many of them are duplicates. That is, I have them both in video and audio versions of the same course. Still. But even so, <laughs> that's at least 100, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's a lot. And um, it, uh, it is absolutely marvelous. Uh, these are the best professors in whatever the subject, from astronomy to zoology and all of the humanities, uh, music, everything, literature, uh, history, and uh, you have just wonderful, at a minimum, you have wonderful infotainment. <laughs> and at a maximum, uh, you have a, a learning experience uh, being conducted by a world authority and somebody known as a great teacher. And so it is really an honor to have one of the great teachers on <laughs> my program here. And I'm not really uh, being hyperbolic. I mean, this is really so. Uh, it is not easy uh, to be tapped to do a, a teaching company course. It's never happened to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> damn. <laughs> but, um, uh, David, tell me, how did this come about? Now, there's, I, I understand there's some interesting uh, history in, involving uh, a person that we both know in common. <laughs> Tell well, us about it. Well, um, uh, the great course, I mean, the teaching company yeah. has um, uh, within it a, a group of recruiters. And yes. Their whole job yeah. is to go out uh -huh. and find uh, professors. But obviously they talk to other people who already, and, have, uh, who have already worked for yeah. them mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. And... Um, and uh, in this case, I believe Bart Ehrman, mm -hmm. who has done several courses yeah. for the Great Courses, mm -hmm. they asked him who would be good to do Gnosticism, and he recommended me. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, a great recruiter for the Great Courses, a guy named Dan, came, you know, started sending me emails and calling me up. And at first I resisted because uh -huh. I didn't really have a, you know, I was chair of a department of religious studies. I had a lot going on. It just didn't feel like I had the time to do it because it is time consuming to do it. Um, but once I moved to Ohio State, I said, well, now maybe I do have the time to do it because I wasn't being a department chair. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you, you you know it's a la it's an elaborate process for them to in the end sure. decide you yeah. can do it <clears throat> but but I think they they recruit by um, you know talking to people and finding out who are popular lecturers mm -hmm. who's doing a job but they also talk to their current the people who've already done courses yeah. for them and and say who do you think would be good at this and so forth. well it certainly was an honor for you to be recommended by Bart Ehrman and yes, yeah, and by yeah. the way for those of our viewers many of you know that for some years now I've had a a wild controversy going with Bart Ehrman. <laughs> but I, of course, have all of Bart's courses, and I have to tell you, they are really, really good. They are excellent. He's a wonderful teacher, uh, and I really uh, would uh, urge all of you to get Bart Ehrman's courses as well. Um, I also want you to read my books, but I, <laughs> I, I really think that you should get Bart's books, uh, Bart's uh, courses too. Um, but the main thing is you should get this course by Dr. Brackey. Um, tell us a bit about how the production takes place. You, know, sure. you have a real set, I understand. Right. Um, you know, they, um, it's important to understand they really, it's, uh, they put a lot of effort into making it a quality yeah. thing. And um, even before you get to do it, so for example, um, you know, I traveled to their office while they were still in, in, Virginia? in Chantilly, Virginia. Yeah. So it's near Dulles Airport in Northern uh -huh. Virginia. And, um, you know, the first thing I did is do a kind of audition lecture. I wrote mm -hmm. a lecture just, you know, mm -hmm. on the discovery of the Nagamati Codices and, you know, worked with the recruiter to make it really good. And then this was actually made available to customers and they could say whether oh, they liked it oh, or not. Oh, I see. So, yes, I was, so first I was, I was market things. tested, so to mm -hmm. speak, right? Yeah, that's that's yeah. what happens first. Um, but then there's a, a, a pretty long and elaborate process in which um, you plan the course content and what each lecture is going to cover. <clears throat> um, you have assigned to you, as I'm speaking as a professor, you, yeah, you have yeah. assigned to you um, a person who, um, in the teaching company, was called an academic content supervisor, who works with you on the content of the lectures, um, their wording, how things are presented, their order, what's covered, and so forth and so on. Um, I made, um, before I even taped the lecture, the, I made two trips out there where I practiced lecturing, mm -hmm. where because indeed, as you said, they have a real set, yeah. which um, varies somewhat by what the course is about, sure, sure. the kinds of things they set around, and so, so forth and so on. Astronomy, it's going to be a bit right. different. Yeah. And you have to get used to, um, for a professor, the big change, there are a couple of changes, yeah. obviously, yeah. Um, is to give a lecture in a room where there's really nobody except well, the, the camera people. In some of the early courses, there's there are definitely people, an right? audience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In the early courses, they yeah. had a they had an audience there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think gathered employees of the company. Yeah, I would, that was right. my impression. Yeah. Right, but no, not anymore. Now yeah. it's a um, you know it's a three camera setup, and so there are people running the cameras, but of mm -hmm. course they're behind the cameras. Yes, so you don't yeah. really no, see, you them. see them. Yeah. So you're uh, delivering a lecture in in a just dark room into the void. <laughs> into the void, and it's it's very different from <clears throat> you know I mean most of us are used to even Certainly. if even if it's a huge room and you're just yeah. lecturing, yeah. getting feedback. You can look at their eyes and say, "Ooh, I'm losing sure. them," or whatever. Sure. They're getting interested. And you yeah. can see what they're seeing. Yeah. You can yeah. stop and say, "Did I did that make sense?" Or whatever. Sure. Yeah. So you have to kind of practice and get used to that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so twice I went out there and did practice sessions where I kind of worked on being good in front of the camera mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, and at those times you also meet with the people there and work on the content of the lectures and so forth and so on. Um, the normal time period from when a course is first thought of, let's do this, yeah. to when it actually comes out is about two years. Wow, wow. So it's a, it's a lengthy process of, you know, and they really work with you to make the lecture as clear and interesting as possible. And, mm -hmm. and what's great about them is they are totally committed to the academic integrity of what they yes, do. They yes, never yeah. asked me to say anything or package things in a way that would sacrifice the right. historical accuracies the I saw. Of it. The, right, exactly. They yeah. totally respect that. And I mean, they work with you on making it accessible sure, and interesting. Sure, of course, yes. But, uh, but they never. Uh, want you to dumb give it down. Up to dumb it. They don't yeah, want you to yeah. dumb it down. No, they yeah. definitely don't want that. Yeah. So, now, um, 
before we talk about the new course that you have in the works with the <laughs> teaching company, we need to talk more about your present course. Right. Um, how, uh, if at all, uh, does your course uh, overlap your book, uh, The Gnostics, or is there new stuff in, in the course? Uh, or how, what, what, how would you compare the course with the book? Uh, the course does a lot more. Yeah, I would think so. Right. It's, it's 24 half-hour lectures. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, um, the book was really making a kind of focused historical argument yeah. about mm -hmm. who the Gnostics were and what was their importance. Um, and it didn't always go into depth into various yeah. things. Uh, the course really does, mm -hmm. and it covers a lot more stuff. In the book, you know, as, as we've seen, one of my approaches to Gnosticism is there are groups like the Mandeans and the yes. Manichaeans that I don't include in that category. Right, right, so in the right. book, I didn't talk about that. Yeah, right, But right. in this course, I do. Yes, and that was um, very nice, though. Right. I, I enjoyed um, that. Yeah. Right. So it um, it talks about um, some medieval stuff. We talk about the Cathars that come yeah. along, Kabbalah and Judaism and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, and so the, the, the course, the great courses, covers a lot more stuff. And it... it um, gets into more detail, actually, than the book does, because I have simply a lot more time. I sure. Have, I mean, you know, sure. you know uh, 24 half-hour lectures, I can really pause and think about stuff in, in some depth, which I love doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was really, I, I really enjoyed uh, your course, and um, as you say, it does indeed have a lot more detail in it than uh, the book did. Mm -hmm. However, what I thought was really important is you could say, well, the book was extremely clear because it didn't have to go into so much detail. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, your course, which does go into a lot of detail, nevertheless retains the clarity that made me respect your, your book. Well, that's one of the, you know, one of the great things about working with the Great Courses people. Yeah. Is that, um, you know, the people you work with there are all, are also not experts in yeah. any of this, right? They're working yeah. on so many yeah, different sure, things, sure. right? And so they are great at saying, I did not understand that, mm -hmm. or this is not clear. Mm -hmm. And so they really mm -hmm. work with you yeah. to Good. make what you're doing clear. And, um, you know, you really, um, you know, and they, if, if, you know, I will, if there was something that wasn't clear, I sat down with them and kind of talked it out, and we kind of figured out the best way to say it so that it would be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting, when you write books for academic audiences yeah. these days, you don't get as much guidance from editors as you used to. No. I mean, it's Sometimes I don't... I wonder if the editors are doing anything. Well, I mean, the, the issue these days with books, obviously, is, um, you know, they don't sell as much as they used yeah, to books. Right. And um, so if if places like, you know, the people who publish the Gnostics or Harvard University Press, if they're going to continue to be in business and yeah, be able to do yeah. this, um, you know, the the level of engagement you get from editors isn't as high as it used to be when I first started yeah, out. Yeah. Um, but with the great courses, I got that level of yeah, engagement. Yeah. I mean, they they know that they're that they want this to be able to be accessible to the people who who um, buy these yeah. things, and so they really work with you to make it accessible. <laughs> you know, I, I, I kind of amused the uh, when you're talking about the people there uh, saying, you know, this doesn't make sense or whatever, um, and, and having you rework something. Um, I'm looking at one of their courses, uh, a new way of viewing differential equations. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, uh, <laughs> who there understood it at all, I wonder. <laughs> Well, yeah, I probably would be lost with that or whatever. But um, but what was you know what's great about working with the great courses? It, what you know they'd say this doesn't make sense, but they also just asked when you're working on it really interesting yeah. questions. Yeah, you know, I said one of the things that you miss when you're doing this is that you don't have an audience and yeah. you don't get the immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. But you had gotten that earlier in the yeah. process, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, so. You know, what often happens is I refer to something that I think just everybody knows, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not just everybody knows, right. you know, and right. so it's, it was helpful when they would say something like, what are you talking about? You know, when I'd mention right. something and uh, so it, it was just a, a, a truly, it was a great process to have people so involved in helping me say mm -hmm. what I wanted mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, anyway, I just hope everybody uh, will get your course. Uh, and by your book, too. Um, now, 
you are in the process of preparing another course for the teaching Right, we've just started, so it's, you know, um, going to be like two years away or yeah, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, but um, we're planning a course that will essentially cover the what we call the, the New Testament Apocrypha. Okay. So the <laughs> kinds of literature, so-called apocryphal gospels and apocryphal acts of the apostles and apocryphal revelations and so on, that uh, did not end up in the canon of the New Testament. I hope you're going to devote a lecture to is it the Clementine recognition switch, mm -hmm. where St. Peter resurrects a smoked fish. Yes. <laughs> yes, there are, there's, there's a whole set of literature called the pseudo-Clementine. Oh, the pseudo-Clementine. Well, the yeah. Clementine recognitions, yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. there are these other, so it's a, there's a whole set of these yeah. tales and so forth. Um, but you're right. I mean, there's a, um, um, I mean, Christians of antiquity and today loved good stories. Yeah. And uh, they had a set of heroic characters. Sure. The apostles. Yeah. And so they wrote stories in which they have adventures and mm -hmm. do heroic things and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And, of course, this already starts in the New Testament with the Acts of the Apostles, where, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get stories of Peter and mostly Paul traveling yeah. around, having, yeah. getting into a shipwreck and all this kind of stuff. And uh, these other texts from uh, the early centuries, you have, you know, Acts of Peter, Acts of Paul, Acts of Thomas, yes. and so on, are just kind of more adventures of these guys. And... Um, you know, I think a lot of this literature, the early Christians themselves, understood to be kind of like pious entertainment and so forth. Really? But it was kind of fun for them to do, I think. Yeah. You, you, you don't think they took it totally seriously? Some of them they did, and some of them I think they did understand in the way of kind of we might understand a historical novel, I, I think. Hmm. Um, you know, I think some of them did see that um, because there was a genre of the novel in antiquity. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course and, there was. Uh, yes. And a lot of these apocryphal acts kind of mimic yeah. those in a way. Yeah. Um, so well, certainly... Some, some they, of my friends claim that the canonical Gospels are uh, imitating things from some of the oh, Greek novels. Oh, certainly, so, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, uh, all of the you know, Christian literature didn't drop out of the sky, right? It, didn't? it No, it did not. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so it really drew upon the... Um, literary forms and genres yeah. that were out there already, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a great question, though, is, um, you know, as you look at the range of early Christian literature and the different kinds of things, did Christians take it all at the same level of seriousness? And um, I expect not. I mean, I think we need to be careful not to think that they were more gullible, so to speak, than mm -hmm. we were. I mean, they definitely thought things were happening. People are pretty gullible today. People are pretty gullible <laughs> today, exactly. But um, but I do think that they themselves had a range of ways in which they interacted with this literature. And mm -hmm. some of it was, you know, probably with some degree of skepticism. Wow, so, I wonder. That's, that, that's shocking to me. I yes, really yeah, I yeah, never yeah. thought about no, that, but I, that way. No, but certainly I think that they, you know, did they believe when they read the New Testament these things really happened? Oh, most definitely Oh, sure, did. yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, but when they heard other stories about Peter doing this, that, and the other thing, could they perhaps enjoy those stories and not necessarily think that <laughs> they really happened? I think that's possible. Now, one of the things that I'd like to ask you about the apocryphal books, uh, mm -hmm. but it also relates to the canonical books, mm -hmm. um, just take the, the four Gospels in the, mm -hmm. in the canon. Mm -hmm. uh, you can argue that each one of these versions, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or I should start with Mark, right. <laughs> Matthew, Luke, and John, um, or maybe John and Luke, I'm not mm -hmm. sure how, how we end it. Right. But... Um, <clears throat> You could argue that each one of these was the gospel mm -hmm. for a particular community. Yes. And that in the formation of the Catholic Church, or the proto-Catholic Church, whatever you want to call it, that these were then combined so that it would be catholicos for, every, for the whole, for everybody. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, by taking these four different communities and, and, and welding them together. Mm -hmm. Now... With the Nag Hammadi scriptures, it might be also possible to postulate certain communities that held this, that, or something else uh, as its gospel mm -hmm. in the singular sense. Um, and I'm wondering about these other apocryphal 
uh, Gospels and Acts and so on. Now you're already indicating that you think that not all of them were, quote, t- taken as gospel. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. But do you see any particular um, identities of, of, of particular different communities that would have held these other uh, Oh, most definitely, right? I mean, um, some of them yes, some of them no, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the most, the best analogy to the four Gospels that made yeah. it into the New Testament would be the Gospel of Thomas. Yeah, right. Which, right. Yeah, which okay. was found at Nag Hammadi, but yeah. there were also fragments yeah. of it yeah. that were discovered yeah. in Greek. Yeah, in, yeah. In, yeah. In other well, when I was with the Jesus Seminar, uh, we included the Gospel of Thomas along Certainly, with the four. Certainly, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the four. But, yeah. Um, but I, th- I mean... Um, there's every reason to believe that there would have been a community that used that as yeah. its gospel. And yeah. that was yeah. what you used, right? Yes, exactly. Um, you know, um, and lots of people think that that might have been in Syria or Mesopotamia where that was happening. Um, so, you know, yes is the answer to that question. Mm-hmm. And I think um, uh, it's not possible or it's not likely that we could take every new te- every early Christian text and postulate a community behind it, right? Um, but some of them must have been. Sure. And um, what you have to look for, I think, when you're going to think about this is when you read the text, are there indications of a group? Yes, yes. And, and a great example is the Gospel of Matthew, for mm-hmm. example, which, mm-hmm. um, you know, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus gives fairly detailed instructions about what to do when a member of the community is not behaving properly, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can read that and you're like, sure. there's a community there's here a community. that they yeah, need yeah. To, yeah. To, to, yeah. You know, to know how to run their organization mm-hmm. and how to make it work. So in a lot of these, you can see the community behind them. Mm-hmm. Others, it's less clear. And so um, scholars are less, you know, eager to exactly yeah, postulate yeah, some sort of community. But yeah. I think you're exactly right, yes. And, yeah. One of the things that I've seen with the canonical Gospels uh, in my own approach is uh, I like to see how, quote, Matthew and Luke mm-hmm. take stuff from Mark and how differently they may be elaborating or changing or, or whatever. And to me, those changes, where anything has changed from what you see in Mark, is a change made because of a particular community that they, the author belonged to. Right. And, and I, I think that these often are um, intended to justify the authority of whoever the rulers are mm-hmm. in that particular community. Um, uh, I, I see, for example, in the embarrassing, uh, to Orthodox uh, embarrassing, um, passages where Jesus is... Uh, dissing his mother and family and so on, uh, woman, what have I to do with thee, and right, so yeah, on, yeah. that uh, these are inexplicable by ordinary uh, canons of reasoning from orthodox principles, but that if, for example, at the time that those verses were written, uh, the authors were, uh, pre- were, were pushing an apostolic type of government, right. Um, that is, they gained their authority from the apostles, and that their main competitors at the time were Christians who were claiming authority by descent from Jesus' family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, with Jesus disrespecting his family, including his mother, <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. this is showing that, no, they aren't the ones that are the bearers of authority. It's us who, you know, have the... the authority transmitted from uh, the apostles. Um, and that type of clue is what I look for in, in trying to determine. Oh, definitely. Things. I mean, um, you know, and, um, you know, in one of my lectures in the Great Courses, I talk about this literature that shows Peter and Mary in conflict. There's yes. all this, yeah. you know, in early yeah. Christian literature, good, you see, good point. I'm thinking, yeah, um, you I, know, I, things where Peter and Mary don't get along. It happens in the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Mary. Peter's name isn't used, but in the Gospel according to Philip, the disciples are like, why do you love Mary more than us, and so forth and so on. Um, You know, and I would say as a historian, this isn't a record of actual conflict between Peter and Mary. No, no. This is the the result of debates in the early Christian church about the relative leadership of men and women. Can women Mm -hmm. do this? Uh, The authority of Peter versus the authority of Mary, both of whom 
the records tell us, saw Jesus shortly after his sure. resurrection. Yeah. We saw him first. Peter yeah. Mar- yeah. So these are debates that are happening within yeah. Christian communities later that, of course, they yeah. are yeah. projecting onto exactly. these characters, exactly. right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I think, one of the important ways that we try to see communal life behind these texts right. at a time when we don't have evidence that is more straightforward for yeah. what was going yeah. on in these Christian groups. Well, I think then that will sum this up, that I will say that this course will give you a more sophisticated and hopefully a more intelligible understanding of how scriptures should be read and viewed, and the fact that uh, there weren't always just four Gospels. That's exactly right. (laughs) That there were more to choose from. Well, I want to thank you once again, uh, Dr. Brackey, for being on my show. This has been very enlightening, and it has been a real pleasure to have you on the show. It's been great. Thanks for having me. That's all for now. Uh, Until next time, I'm Frank Zindler for American Atheist Press.